It is birthday season in our household. First it is M, then Andrew, and then just two days ago it was George's 21st birthday. As a family, we usually celebrate with a meal. We invite those who we love to join us and we eat lots. This is going to be difficult. <laughs> Quite often we combine a meal with a treat, especially if it's a big birthday, a day out somewhere that would suit the birthday girl or boy. For George's birthday this week, we went to the Body World exhibition, seeing cut up human bodies plasticised so you can see down to every last nerve ending, every last blood vessel. Fascinating. And surely this couldn't have happened by accident. There must have been a designer. This was then followed by the Science Museum, a very George kind of day out. For Andrew, we had a spa day, a time to relax and recoup the body as well as the soul. These days are not necessarily cheap days and being clergy and student family, we're not rich, but they are worth the cost because they are a celebration of the love that we have for one another, the friendship that we enjoy, and the thankfulness for the many blessings that we share. Today, we read the story of another family, Lazarus, Mary and Martha. We know them. We've read several stories about this family. They're interesting because they're not disciples in the same way as others. They don't follow Jesus around as the twelve do. But they seem to know who and what he is, and they welcome him to their home regularly. Did they grow up together? Were they friends before Jesus' ministry started? Well, it seems so, but we just don't know. What we do know from previous stories is that they recognise Jesus as the Son of God, and they offer him love, love and kindness, somewhere to call home a family. The story we read this morning is not really so surprising. They are friends. They talk. They will have heard from Jesus what he knows is about to happen to him in only a few weeks' time. He has, after all, only recently raised their beloved brother Lazarus from the dead. Wouldn't you want to lavish as much love and money and care and gratitude as you could? The rest of the disciples are there too, each with his own gifts and graces. Judas's job, we read, was to carry the common purse, but he was corrupt. Of course, we know Judas later betrays Jesus to the authorities. But in this passage, he raises a fair question. Why doesn't Mary sell the perfume and give the money to the poor? It could have brought meals for hundreds, maybe even saved a life or two. But Jesus assures them that she is in the right. In fact, she might even be the model disciple here, prefiguring when Jesus will wash the disciples' feet a few, just a few chapters away. Each character in the story has his or her, uh, her own role. Martha, Mary, the disciples, even Judas, all living together and seeking to serve. But none of this makes Jesus' answer any more explicable. On the surface, it doesn't make easy sense. Jesus, the guy who is always helping out the poor, giving the preferential treatment to those in need, accepts, even praises, a gift that could have been sold and the proceeds given to so many others. Congregations today have similar debates. How to spend or raise large portions of money for an organ, for decorations, for the building. A church I read about recently in Atlanta, USA, voted not to replace their air conditioner due to the high cost and gave away the money instead. There's that famous episode of the Vicar of Dibley, where after much debate, they replace the large, broken and very beautiful stained glass window with just plain glass and give the money that they would have spent away to charity. Other congregations debate that organs are so very expensive and used only once a week 
Should they be sold and the money given to the poor? Who knows? God speaks to different congregations in different ways. But this passage suggests that God isn't always put off by extravagant gifts that are short-lived. Ultimately, though, this passage is not a lesson in economic justice, but in theological awareness. Mary knew more than any of the other disciples what, that Jesus' death was near. He soon would be arrested, tortured, crucified. Mary's anointing seized that moment, one of the few moments left with Jesus. Mary's act of anointing reminds us all of other biblical anointing, anointing of kings, just as she anticipates anointing Jesus' body for burial. She knew what was coming, so Mary was lavish in living out in the present. Sadly, throughout Christian history, some have used Jesus' response to Mary, the poor will always be with you, as a justification for not helping the poor. These interpreters miss the fact that Jesus was probably alluding to a passage from Deuteronomy, which commands generosity towards the poor, exactly because there will never cease to be some in need on this earth. It's a call to action, not in an inaction. Or the theologian Stanley Hauervas takes an even, even further step. The poor that we have with us is Jesus. It is the poor that all extra extravagance is to be given. So what is extravagant giving for us? What is a lavish life of service? Well, we know it doesn't look the same for each of us, at least not in practice. Some have time to give, others skills, others give money. Just as we are gifted from God with different gifts, we respond to God's grace in different ways. There's a commonality but a sim and a similar goal. Following in Mary's footsteps, in Jesus' footsteps, isn't something to do half-heartedly or part way. A few chapters later in John's Gospel, Jesus gives his life, his whole life, for all of us. We miss the point if we are just Christians on a Sunday morning, responding to Jesus' ultimate gift, takes our whole life, our whole self, every single day. And if that's the case, if giving one's life to God isn't about a big act or two, but about one's whole life, then it turns out gifts are hard to measure. It's like when Paul instructs believers to pray without ceasing. He wasn't meaning walk around with one's hands clasped and head bowed all the time. What Paul was getting at in 1 Thessalonians is making one's whole life a gift, so much so that every act, every breath, is an offering to God. In our second reading from Philippians this morning, Paul says, what are yet whatever gains I had, I have come to regard these as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ in my life. In other words, nothing is worth anything if we don't have God. When our whole life is a gift, when our every act becomes prayer, then lavish givings, giving comes naturally. There will be times when you feel called to give in a way that the world sees as uncalled for, when in your estimation it's just like living a life of service to God. I think of those who give of their professional skills to help others, doctors who give up their holiday time to volunteer for Médecins Sans Frontières, or lawyers who give up their free time to help asylum seekers, or those who offer their gifts beyond those whom they know and love, for those who visit prisons or hospitals, who give up their time to feed the homeless, to volunteer at kids' clubs or uniformed groups. As a church, we offer those who come to us the best of what we have, the best coffee, food, hospitality. Those who help to serve others succeed without judgment or counting cost, just seeing it as their gift to give. 
Ultimately, maybe the biggest difference between Mary and Judas is that Mary gives out of her abundance, while Judas sees scarcity. Scarcity. Mary understands the enormous gift Jesus will give, and out of that ultimate gift, she sees plenty, grace for all. But Judas, well, he's like many of us. He sees scarce commodities and few resources. If we're always worried about getting more, buying more, making more, then it's hard to give because we're focused on what we don't yet have. If, like Judas, you love more, you will never have enough. If, like Mary, you love grace, then everything, even life itself, is a gift from God. And giving of oneself is giving out of God's great gift to us. Let us never forget that, like Lazarus, Jesus promises us raising from the dead. So as we journey on to the end of Lent and look upon Jesus' last days in Jerusalem and his ultimate gift on the cross, may we be moved to give of ourselves as well, not out of fear or scarcity, but in free response to God's love and forgiveness. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.